Welcome to Molecular Devices Cellular Imaging Webinar Series on a tunable optogenic system which elucidates the role of beta-catenin signaling dynamics on neural stem cell differentiation. My name is Krishna Chandy, and I am the Product and Applications Manager for Cellular Analysis at Molecular Devices, and I'll be your host today. I'll start the webinar with a brief overview of high-content imaging before turning it over to Dr. Alyssa Rosenblum. As our WebEx host mentioned, please submit questions at any time during the webinar. Press on the Q&A button on the toolbar to expand the Q&A window. Type questions into the Q&A window. From the Ask drop-down, choose All Panelists, and then press the Send button. That way, all of us, Alyssa and myself, and can see these questions at the same time. We will hold the questions and ask them verbally at the end of the WebEx. So now I will give an overview of high-content imaging solutions. Why the focus on stem cells? Stem cells and cells derived from induced pluripotent stem cells provide a biologically relevant model for research and drug screening. Molecular Devices has been collaborating with vendors and researchers in the stem cell field to bring these and better tools to market. We have worked with Cell Dynamics International, as an example, and at iCell Cardium Life Sites for advanced screening of cardiotoxic compounds in a physiologically relevant model. These cells show appropriate adjustable activity cell signaling and mechanical contractions, and then allow one to do high throughput screening on spontaneously beating cardiomyocytes. Additionally, we have worked with iPSC-derived hepatocytes. These cells show phospholipidosis and metabolic-dependent toxicity and are likely better models for liver toxicity screening. Both of these and iCell neurons have been shown to be amenable for high throughput screening in our hands. Dr. Rosenblum, on the other hand, has been working at a, at a different phase of stem cell biology and understanding the signaling events that differentiate stem cells from ultimate fate. And she's been using high content imaging to help advance that, those, that research. In case you're not completely familiar with high content, high throughput imaging, I'll spend a minute giving an overview of the workflow and the potential applications. Traditionally, biologists would treat some cells with drugs or growth factors and put them on a microscope slide after staining them or in some way marking the response with fluorescent proteins. Or they may be looking at morphological changes with transmitter light. Now, instead of appearing at them through the eyepiece, they take pictures or images to study and get a sense of whether or not the cells reacted to a drug or other perturbant. Even if the acquisition of the conventional microscope or confocal microscope is automated, the hands-on time can be multiple hours, and the skills to run a successful experiment may be high. And then after you've collected the data, the images, there are many possibilities of how you analyze that that data using a variety of third-party tools to try to make sense of those Im images. Uh, or maybe you're just simply judging it uh, by eye. A high-throughput imaging system, experiments can be easy, just as easily run on anything from a microscope slide to 1536 volt plates with no compromise in image quality. The image access microsystem can be set up in a few minutes and the biologist can walk away while the images are acquired and even sent immediately for analysis by the integrated software. Once numbers are generated for the parameters of interest, responsive cells or wells can be identified, statistically analyzed, plotted, and conclusions drawn. Since all images and measurements are stored together in a database, the burden of keeping the data organized is removed from the scientists, and the results can be shared within the network company or organization. The hands-on time is dramatically shortened due to the automated and seamless integration of acquisition, analysis, and viewing of results. Mm -hmm. 
Briefly, there are hundreds of applications that can be done with automated imaging. Obviously, these slides list just a subset of them. In these images, you'll see examples of co-cultured liver and fibroblast cells, a high magnification image which can be used to measure different subcellular structures, as well as angiogenesis assay in a gel matrix. This slide shows more examples, including sample images of neuric outgrowth, a 3D spheroid, and transcendent zebrafish. The complete solution for automated imaging begins with reliably acquiring in-focus images of every site, now with the ability to collect images of a wide z-plane if using a 3D sample. Then you'll identify objects using algorithms that are designed for your specific asset type. You receive multiple measured parameters from the image analysis that you can then use to draw your conclusions using the data analysis application we offer to pull the numbers out of the database for generation of EC curves to use with hit finding tools. This allows you to complete the workflow from acquisition to uh, hit, hit finding slash data mining. Molecular devices provide an end-to-end -end workflow including each of the previously mentioned steps, starting with the image acquisition using one of our image express systems shown here at the top. Image analysis is carried out using the MedExpress or MedExpress PowerCore software. In the center of it all, we have a data management solution in our MDC, MDC store database. MedExpress automatically communicates with the management solution to store images and present them back to you for visualization and analysis. MDC store also links the results of your analysis to the acquired plates. The data mining software, Acute Express, communicates with the database and allows processing of the results. It also allows you to compare or combine results from multiple plates across a screen. There are many choices for your automated imager. Uh, uh, Alyssa will be presenting data she acquired on the ImageX Micro XLS. The Image, Image Express Micro 4 is our newest wide field system that is field upgradable to confocal uh, if you need that change. Uh, the Image Express confocal system is ideal for any assays that might have high background, particularly for many of, uh, of the 3D assays that are now in, in vogue. Either any of these instruments will allow you to acquire Z stacks and utilize our software's 3D analysis capabilities, including uh, not just limited to 2D analysis um, assays. MedExpress Med software is key to high kernel imaging. The software not only runs the instrumentation but provides different levels of analysis tools, proceeding from simple on the left to extreme flexibility on the right. Our turnkey solution allows a scientist to easily evaluate images using one of numerous available application modules, such as multi-wavelength self-scoring, self-cycle, or new right outgrowth. Custom modules allow a user to build a personalized analysis using standard and custom algorithms to generate specific data such as volumes, um, uh, distances, um, and I will show you some more examples on the next slide. All the modules can be saved and shared between users. Journal macros allow power users the ultimate control to perform sophisticated procedures, including uh, hardware control and integrating hardware and analysis to make smart decisions on the fly. As I mentioned, within MedExpress, you have the ability to build your own application module. Here are a few examples uh, from uh, measuring mitotic spindles and centrosomes, uh, label-free self-proliferation assays, not just measuring uh, the length of neurites or neurite output, but actually uh, finding puncta along neurites. And if you're doing 3D analysis, as an example, measuring distance from a, a 3D, in a, within a 3D spheroid. So those are some of the examples of modules that can be created and then rerun as uh, standard modules by your users. And 
this time, I would like to, we are pleased to have Dr. Alyssa Rosenblum from UC Berkeley with us today. Dr. Rosenblum explores the effects of temporal dynamic signaling on adult hippocampal neural stem cell state decisions. She received dual bachelor in science degrees at Texas A&M University, where she explored links between prostate and brain cancers. Dr. Rosenblum then completed her doctorate in molecular and cell biology at the University of California at Berkeley in the lab of Dr. Carlos Bustamante. Dr. Rosenblum aspires to move into industrial research following her postdoc with a focus on stem cells and cellular response assay development with translational applications towards the development of personalized medical treatments. And as a reminder, we will conclude today's webinar with a question and answer session, which you can submit those questions at any time during this webinar. Hello, my name is Alyssa Rosenblum, and I am an NINDS NRSA postdoctoral fellow in David Schaefer's lab at UC Berkeley. I would like to thank Molecular Devices for inviting me to talk to you today about my work regarding tunable optogenetic system elucidation of the role of beta-catenin signaling dynamics on neural stem cell differentiation. Adult neurogenesis is found predominantly in the subventricular zone of the lateral ventricles and the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus. The manipulation of endogenous neurogenesis is an attractive target for therapeutic treatments for neurodegenerative disorders. But for such treatments to be effective, we must first better our understanding of the complicated stem cell niche. Neural stem cells exist in a complicated environment where they experience input from the mechanical properties of the extracellular matrix, secreted signals, cell-to-cell -cell contact from neighboring glial cells, and small molecules. These signals can be presented at varying dosages, both in intensity and in time. There is precedence for a strong effect of signal fluctuations in time, spanning the rapid effects of electrical pulses to protein signaling cascades and on up to the external environment. So this leads us to our major questions. Is there a key temporal threshold for stem cells to execute safe decisions? How do cells integrate or discard signal fluctuations? How does the cell choose between conflicting signals? Traditionally, we could explore these questions using small molecules or ligand application over specific time periods. However, it is difficult to explore the effects of high-frequency fluctuations, and often small molecules or ligands have off-targets. Light, which can be easily, precisely, and reversibly modulated in space, time, and intensity, offers a unique solution through the lens of optogenetics defined by the genetic encoding of a light-responsive protein to perturb or control a cellular behavior, optogenetics has grown from the landmark channel adoption control of neural firing to include a variety of light-responsive proteins which allow for the perturbation of cell behavior at varying levels from neural firing to signaling networks. I focused my attention on the classic neuronal differentiation pathway in adult neural stem cells canonical Wnt signaling. In the absence of Wnt3A ligand, beta-catenin, which is constitutively produced, is also continuously marked for degradation through phosphorylation by the destruction complex, consisting of axon, APC, GSK3-beta, and CK1-alpha. However, when Wnt3A binds to frizzled, LRP6 is recruited. A downstream signaling cascade is initiated, which results in the inhibition of the destruction complex and the stabilization of the beta-catenin population, which translocates back into the nucleus to act as a transcriptional co-activator and driving forward the expression of neurospecific genes. We infiltrated the system by fusing cryptochrome 2, a blue light responsive protein from Arabidopsis, to LRP6. Upon blue light exposure, CRY2 forms homo-oligomers, clustering its LRP6 cargo as well. Clustered LRP6 is sufficient to initiate the downstream canonical wind pathway. Lucas Bugai, a previous grad student, characterized the CRY2 LRP6 oligomerization and activity by fusing it to M-cherry 
and showing visible clustering within 20 seconds of blue light exposure, which dissipated on the order of 10 to 15 minutes when light was removed. Luciferase reporter assays demonstrated extensive beta-catenin activity after 16 hours of illumination. I then set out to use our specific and reversible optogenetic system to control canonical wind signaling to explore the effects of dynamic temporal signal fluctuations. The workflow consists of adult neural stem cells isolated from rat hippocampus and maintained in a proliferative stage with FGF2. CRY2 LRP6 is delivered via retrovirus. FGF is removed and the cells are cultured in a basal media with half percent FBS. The NSCs are then placed on blue light sources for illumination with specific temporal light patterns over 120 to 144 hours. Neurogenesis is determined by a needle staining to the immature neuronal marker beta-3 tubulin. High content imaging was performed using a black walled 96 well plate and a 10x objective on an image express micro XLS system. I first examined the effect of varying the intensity of light while maintaining continuous illumination for 120 hours. I found that the amount of neurogenesis was directly proportional to the intensity of the illumination, serving as a dose response to optogenetic induction of signal. The gray line marks the amount of neurogenesis at 50% intensity. I then kept the intensity at maximum, but varied the temporal frequency of signal such that all cells received light for 50% of the total time, but at varying T on T off patterns. I noted a significant drop in neurogenesis under low frequency, specifically when the off time exceeded 24 hours. The gray line again marks the amount of neurogenesis I observed under 50% I explored the possibility of glial genesis, quiescence, or proliferation. However, what I discovered is a significant decrease in cell survival. Cell death was measured by staining with the apoptotic specific annexin 5. The decrease in cell survival was most notable when T off exceeded 27 hours. I then returned to our initial intensity parameters and examined cell survival. I found no significant effect on cell survival under continuous illumination, even under low intensity conditions. If I compare this to my oscillating illumination results, it is clear that the loss of cell survival phenotype is specific to low frequency signal fluctuations. In order to better understand beta-catenin activity in response to signal fluctuation, I used a beta-catenin TCF reporter driving a destabilized venus. The venus is targeted for degradation after production with a rapid half-life. NSCs with a stably integrated reporter were infected with CRY2 LRP6 and exposed to varying signal frequencies. Total integrated fluorescence was measured every six hours. The light blue line, the continuous illumination control, receives twice the net amount of illumination as the other conditions. Beta-catenin activity saturates at approximately 48 hours. The dark line is our dark negative control, showing no measurable fluorescence. Clear beta-catenin activity fluctuation corresponding to the optogenetic illumination pattern was observed. Under low-frequency oscillations, long periods of no measurable beta-catenin activity began to appear. When I more closely examined the on-off activity slopes, the rate of beta-catenin activity increase remains consistent across all frequencies. More surprisingly, I found that beta-catenin activity returned to a baseline negligible activity within 12 to 15 hours, regardless of the T on. This indicates rapid active clearing of beta-catenin as well as extended periods of beta-catenin activity loss in low-frequency oscillations, allowing time for other transcriptional pathways to potentially affect cell fate. To address this, 
I performed unbiased RNA-seq on multiple temporal illumination patterns, including extended signal T-off, as well as mimicked patterns done with wnt 3 ligand and a small molecule GSK3-beta inhibitor, TUR, which inhibits the destruction complex, stabilizing the beta-catenin population. I found approximately 50 genes that exhibited similar expression patterns across all three stimuli of canonical WNT signaling, which include genes regulating differentiation and survival, survival, cell cycle, cell stress, and apoptosis. To be a bit mysterious, as this work is not yet published, I did find one very promising hit from our RNA-seq search, which I will call HIT2 for the purposes of this talk. I cultured NSEs for 72 hours in three conditions, basal, which is half percent FBS, differentiating, which is half percent FES plus three micromolar CHUR, and withdrawal, where NSEs were first incubated with three micromolar CHUR for 24 hours, then in basal media for the next 48. As expected, wild-type NSEs demonstrated strong neurogenesis in the presence of a GSK3 beta inhibitor and lost neurogenesis under withdrawal conditions. However, overexpression of HIT2 significantly rescued neurogenesis under signal withdrawal conditions. I then knocked out HIT2 with CRISPR-Cas9. Knocking out HIT2 resulted in significant delay in neurogenesis under differentiating conditions. Overexpressing HIT2 in the knockout cells rescued the effects of HIT2 overexpression. This demonstrates that HIT2 protects and promotes neurogenesis when the differentiation signal is lost. I then looked at cell survival and found that overexpression of HIT2 fully rescued cell survival under signal withdrawal conditions. Knocking out HIT2 also demonstrated increased cell survival, but I hypothesized that it is because fewer cells underwent an initial differentiation fate choice. Overexpressing HIT2 in the knockout background rescued cells back to the overexpressor phenotype. These results demonstrate that HIT2 is also capable of protecting cell survival when the differentiation signal is lost. The data I have presented is based on population measurements of thousands of cells. However, each individual cell begins with its own history of previous signal integration, which may affect its progression from proliferation into its ultimate cell fate. To further tease out what factors may be determinate, our lab developed a novel platform array for spatially isolating single neural stem cells. Slides are coated with a thin layer of polyhema and patterned with UV light. Functionalized silane is vapor deposited. Amine terminated oligonucleotides are deposited in small defined spots and bind to the slide via reductive animation. Slides are placed in a four-chamber well context. Cells are incubated with lipid conjugated complementary DNA oligos and washed over the prepared slide. The deposited DNA spots are small enough such that a single cell bound to the spot covers it, preventing additional cells from binding within the microisland. Bound cells can be incubated using normal tissue culture protocols and assayed for endpoints. However, they can also be longitudinally tracked over time using the live cell imaging capabilities of the Image Express system. Here I show an initial assay where NSEs were stably infected with the Fuji fluorescent cell cycle tracking system. M. Cherit is expressed during G1 and M. Venus is expressed during SG2. Cells are dark while undergoing mitosis. This is one cell in one microisland out of hundreds deposited on a single slide. Therefore, using this novel platform, each individual cell's journey to their cell fate decision can be chronicled, offering additional insights into how adult neural stem cells interact with their microenvironment. In summary, optogenetics offers a uniquely suited method for studying temporal dynamics of canonical WNT signaling. 
Neural stem cells are relatively insensitive to high-frequency signal fluctuation, but show decreased neurogenesis and cell survival under low-frequency signal fluctuation. Beta-catenin activity is rapidly lost when signal is withdrawn, regardless of T on. HIT2 promotes cell survival upon signal loss and is necessary for normal neurogenesis. I would like to thank my excellent mentor, David Schaefer, as well as the rest of the Schaefer Lab. I would also like to thank my collaborators, Lucas Bugai, Andrew Bremer, and Robbie Kane, as well as our stem cell facility microscopy manager, Mary West. This work is supported by an S32 fellowship from the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. And with that, I'm very happy to take your questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Alyssa. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, uh, for those on uh, the attendees, uh, as a reminder, uh, please uh, submit um, uh, questions through this um, window and select all panelists um, um, and send those to us and we'll monitor them. A um, couple of questions have come up. Um, why might cells have specific temporal responses to signaling changes? Yeah, so cells exist in a very dynamic microenvironment. In fact, this is true in many places within the body. They're experiencing signals that um, are bombarding them constantly, and they need to make decisions about which signals to integrate and which signals to discard um, or else they would be answering everything all the time. So it's actually really important that they have these filtering or thresholding mechanisms to help them make the proper decision based on either the intensity or the frequency that they're receiving the signal. Okay. Uh, a methodological question. Um, which uh, virus do you, did you use to transduce your, uh, your, um, the cells that in, in one of the early slides? Uh, we use retrovirus for infection of our neural stem cells. We can use lentivirus or AAV as well, um, but retrovirus seems to have the highest efficacy. Okay. Um, what are potential pathways that might be, become activated upon beta catenin loss? Yeah, that's really interesting. We're still really um, stru or, or exploring what are potential loss pathways. So beta catenin is a a transcriptional coactivator that predominantly binds TCF but can also bind other transcription factors. Um, so there's a couple possibilities. One, we could be losing uh, differentiation-specific pathways that sort of place the cells in a, in a confused state, which may uh, initiate apoptosis. It's also possible that beta-catenin and TCF are acting as an apoptotic uh, pathway suppressor, uh, either binding to um, a set of uh, genes that are, would normally be turned on uh, to promote apoptosis and keeping them repressed. And we're still trying to tease out what are the possible mechanisms. Okay. Uh, another methodological question. So um, uh, you, at, towards the end, you had a movie that uh, you looked at cell cycle. So how long was that? Um, how long were you monitoring cells on the system? Yeah, so we monitor those cells for 48 hours. We are finding, this is using the live cell longitudinal capabilities of the IXM, we are finding some challenges um, with keeping uh, cells uh, alive for very long periods of time, especially in a relatively low media context. Um, we are troubleshooting that uh, pretty actively. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so, um, yeah, for those online people, once they get the troubleshooting done, people um, do use the system to watch cells for 48 or even uh, 72 hours, and uh, some stem cell people have been doing, you know, like week-long experiments. Yeah, um, it's, it's mostly a function of the four-well chamber slide that we're using and, and the context that we're using it in, as opposed to a limitation of the system itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's great. And the other assays that you showed, were they mostly live cell or fixed cell uh, assays, the beta catenin? Sorry, the, uh, the beta tubulin staining and the apoptosis assays and things like that. So the apoptotic assays are done on live cells, but the apoptotic stain uh, rapidly kills the cells, so you pretty much stain them for 
an X and 5 image and then go ahead and fix to get your endpoint assays for beta-3 tubulin. However, all of the reporter assays with the destabilized venous were done on live cells. That was done over a period of six days where the cells were um, kept on their respective blue light uh, systems and then removed every six hours to be imaged on the ICRA. Great. Um, back to um, the, the, the stem, the, the basic of your work. Uh, what population versus individual factors might be influencing cell fate decisions? Certainly. So the stem cells are experiencing both uh, intrinsic signaling pathways as well as paracrine signaling from neighboring cells. So, for example, I'm sure people know with both iPSCs and with uh, our stem cells, they don't like to be cultured alone. They're actually really dependent on the paracrine signaling of their neighboring cells. So that's one, one set of influences that we're also having to take into consideration uh, in in addition to the signaling that we're placing on is that the density at which the cells are plated and also um, sort of the health of the cells is really important to what their endpoints end up being. This could have important uh, um, applications when you start thinking about treating neurodegenerative disorders by activating the endogenous population. If you deplete the uh, uh, stem cell population all the way into neurons instead of maintaining a sort of balance between both stem and uh, maturing neurons, you might lose that really critical paracrine signaling. Great. Are there any, any additional questions uh, from the audience? If not, we will um, uh, be ending. Um, I want to thank you for attending. Uh, if you have additional questions for either me or Lisa, our email addresses are on this slide. Um, you can learn more about um, our product at our, on our website, moleculardevices.com, and follow the, um, uh, the website to high content imaging. And if you want to learn more about uh, the work that uh, Lisa does in uh, Dr. David Schaefer's lab, um, that website is listed as well. And people often want to know when um, the webinar will be posted. It will be posted within two to four weeks. Uh, of this time frame, and we do not share the PowerPoint, but um, we will let you know when, when the webinar has been reposted for um, on-demand viewing. So if there are no more questions, um, I think this concludes our webinar today.